Hey everybody, welcome back. And today I can't tell you how many takes I've done of this, too many, but we're gonna look at how to set up a ENG Cinetype lens on a Canon C300 Mark III or C500 Mark II body. And we're also gonna cover the Canon lens, even though I have the Fujinhan lens on here and no, when I put these two together, there wasn't like, you know, demonic smoke and fire and crazy things happening. It, well, sort of eventually worked. And that's what I really want to talk about is how to get these two things to work together because there is surprisingly no information about that. In today's age of Facebook, internet, everything is online and documented. You'd think you just buy the pieces and put it together and it work and it doesn't. And so I want to try and save you weeks of wasted time, phone calls, emails, whatever's um, to get this to work together. So let's talk about this first. Can C300 Mark III. And of course the preferred mount is to put on the PL mount. And that's an extra, well, 1500 bucks. That kind of hurts. And one of the things you have to keep in mind is it's got four screws in the front and they have to be torqued into the correct torque, which is fairly small. Seven to eight inch pounds. It's a pretty low setting. And the point being, if you strip these holes out, you're in for a really, really expensive repair. Uh, you're going to have to change the frame out as far as I know, or at least some front part inside the camera that's a major disassembly. So you don't want to strip these holes out if you switch this mount back and forth on any regularity back to the EF mount, which I do. 60 bucks for a micro torque wrench, and it's not a, you should get it, no, you have to get it. It's way cheaper than the repair. Once you got the PL mount on, well, you figure let's put the lens on. And since this lens has a servo grip, you need to power it. The PL mount on this camera is an active mount, meaning it's got power and it's got data connections. And the idea is that you can power up the lens and you can get data back and forth for iris, zoom, focal length, EXIF data, whatever else can be had out of the lens. And that works with primes. It doesn't work with zoom lenses. And that includes Canon's lens, by the way. You would think that Canon's lens would work on here, but it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't work is nobody's going to tell you how much power is present in this PL mount. Now, there are some cameras that put out quite a bit of power and whatever you stick in there, they're going to power up kind of like on the ENG camera with the Sony hot shoe contact system. You just stick the lens in the mount, lock it up, and you're ready to go. You kind of assume this. People lead you to believe that that's the case, and it's not. So if you put the Fujinon lens on, it'll sort of power up. It'll kind of make like it's malfunctioning. And I kind of had a heart attack about this. You know, I've spent all this money. I finally get the lens. I waited two months for it to come from Japan. And it's acting bizarrely. It sort of works like it starts to do its little calibration thing when you start it up. Uh, the zoom sort of works, but it's just doing really weird things. The Canon lens, if you happen to put that on, will do nothing. It just plays dead when you put it on the straight mount. So a lot of back and forth happened. Fujinon gave me some absolutely great support as far as figuring this out with a loaner lens and loaner cable. Oh, what did I say cable? Well, okay. So there is a cable here that goes from the bottom of the grip round down through here and into the back of the camera here. And we'll get to that in a second. I asked for two months, do I need a cable to make this work? And I was assured this would work in the active lens mount and be fine. Well, guess what? It doesn't. Neither does Canon's lens for that matter. So great. I get a cable, I hook it up, it works. Oh yeah, but you have to get the back here. This is the expansion back, which is another 1500 bucks, and you're basically buying it to get the extra lens port because it's not on the body. That was, to me, was a very strange decision, especially if Canon wants to sell their uh, very pricey uh, cine zoom lenses, which are powered, have servo grips, and require power. So I had called Canon Cinema Support, and they couldn't give me any good straight answers. 
I mean, the people are really nice. I love them. Um, they know a lot of things, but when you get into some really technical aspects about the camera, they can't tell you how much power is in the lens mount. It's not in any of the documentation, at least nothing public. I'm sure they have it internally. I'm sure there's engineering documents, but you're not prying that information out of them. And that's, you know, maybe on a consumer camera, but not on a camera in this price range and in the market is the same for That's not right. Anyway, you have to get this cable and there's one cable available and guess what? It is really long. Imagine that. It's just over one meter long and this is the only cable you can buy in the U.S. right now. There may be other shorter cables available. This cable came from Bujinon. It's a beautifully built cable. It's around just over 200 bucks and it's totally worth it because the lens doesn't work without it and there's no other options, at least not in the U.S. Maybe we'll see somebody like Alvin's Cables come along and make a Lens control cable, it's about 24 or 26 inches long for this application and for some other cameras it needed just a little bit longer cable, but it is what it is. Now, you'd say, oh yeah, but I'm going to put the Canon lens on here. That'll work, right? Eh, no, because I've had that lens on this camera. Their lens cable is mounted up in the hand grip and it's just about makes it to here. It's about two or maybe three inches short of actually being able to get into the connector. Now, I'm on a rant here, but it begs the question, why don't they just angle this connector forward and it would have fit? I don't know. So, if you got the Canon lens, then you need to buy the Canon extender, which is an ex about a six inch long extender wire, 200 bucks, um, to make it from here to there. And then it, you got the lens powered, but that doesn't mean everything works, right? Well, it should work, right? It, especially if you put a Canon lens on here, right? Okay, this is the Fujinon. This is a really nice, simple kind of old style grip. You got your zoom in, zoom out. You've got your automatic manual iris. You got two buttons. Uh, typically this would be VTR return and this would be your quick expose and of course record trigger. Rocker works exactly as expected. The record works exactly as expected. VTR, you can kind of define what you want to do with it. There is a set of dip switches in here that you can flip them in different positions and they will tell the camera what to do, but you don't necessarily have anything useful that you're going to do with this button. I think you could set it up for a quick zoom where the lens zooms in to maximum. You can focus and let it snap back. Um, that's a good way of setting that button up. The quick shot exposed just doesn't work. And it doesn't work on a Canon lens either. Why not? Well, my best guess is it's a firmware issue in the body. They're just not reading the signal from the switch correctly or they're just not doing anything with it. There are a pair of buttons up on the front on the C300 bodies and you can program them to do whatever you want. So you've got this guy here and you've got this one here. And right now I have this button on the far side set up for the exposure button. And let me power this up. I'm going to show you one other thing that this does. I'm going to, I've got this kind of arbitrarily set right now, the positions of the uh, lens. I'm going to flip this on. The camera boots up super quick. I mean, I love how quick this camera boots. We're pretty much ready to shoot right now. The lens is doing its calibration thing. And something really weird that this lens does is wherever you were, it runs the calibration back and forth and it doesn't return to where it was. Right now the lens went to 8 on the iris and 20 on the zoom and if the focus motor had been engaged it would have went, ran back and forth and stopped somewhere around four and a half, ten, or 5 feet. Really strange. You can disable that um, with a dip switch that it doesn't do the calibration but then it wants you to rock the stuff back and forth to manually calibrate it. I haven't messed with it that much but it should be alright. So now that we got this lens fired up, I want to quick expose something and I'm just kind of shooting arbitrarily at the wall and some junk here and I'm going to hit the quick expose button and I have the lens in manual right now and nothing's happening. Oh, wait, let's flip the lens to the other way. Now let's hit it. Oh, okay. It worked. Great.
So now I should be able to, you know, mess around with this exposure, except the servo motor is on the iris right now. Well, I'll just take it off again, right? Okay, it's working. Sometimes this disengages, sometimes it doesn't. I have no clue. Canon lens, pretty much the same behavior. They don't quite have this control working correctly. Now, on the body here, there is a dial, which is like almost impossible to find by file when the feel when this thing is engaged. And let's spin it. And nothing's happening. So let's go flip this back into the other position, which I think is automatic. And now, hey, look at that. I have control of the aperture by spinning this dial. I have the fine mode engaged, so it's not too steppy. But with the cage, I mean, without the cage, this button's kind of tricky to find, but you can sort of find it. But with this cage involved, it's recessed enough that it's hard to get to. And I know people have complained this button sticks out too much, the dial, and that they hit it by accident. But to me, it's exactly the opposite. It's buried too far into the body, and you can't really get a finger on this easily, or you can't necessarily feel it. I mean, I'm adjusting it. But if you can picture when you got the camera up on your shoulder and you're trying to thumb the adjustment, it's 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 hard. It's tricky. And that's why I think I may take this piece of the cage off so I've got better access to this and the two ND buttons. Because, when, again, when you've got this up on your shoulder and you're trying to hit this, um, it's it's hard to feel these. And when this is out of the way, it's it's much easier to get to. That in and of itself may not be too big a deal since... The cheese plate screwed in to the body frame on the top with four screws and this side piece is on the other side of the camera tying it to the bottom. So it's pretty well tied together. So I think if I take this off, um, I'm probably not going to miss anything. Once the servo actually engages and it's on, the body is kind of taking control of the aperture, it usually doesn't want to let you. Let's flip it. Yeah, it doesn't want to let you take manual control back. It wants you to use the style to set it. And the servo, I can feel this, the servo is engaged. So, now yeah, we'll flip the switch back. Servo's in, servo's out. It just feels very heavy. But the servo's not fighting me. But if I spin this, it's not doing anything. All right. This has been something that I've struggled with a little bit. It's not always been consistent. And to me, you turn the camera on, it should always do the same thing. So maybe I'm still feeling my way through this and trying to figure out exactly what's getting on, going on. But it's not necessarily intuitive. I should be able to flip the manual or automatic switch and it's controls on here it's the button on here and that's it and this thing whatever um, i haven't really found a way to disable it it's in right now it's out okay so today it's working okay great so enough talking about the lens let's talk about the rods You might have noticed that I've got these long black rods in, and they're not the ones that come with the shape setup. And I bought the whole setup, basically, except for the top handle as a package, because it's cheaper to do it that way. Anyway, you've got this rod in here, and it's just a wee bit shorter. And in and of itself, maybe that doesn't seem like a big deal until you decide... Oh, hey, I want to put the map box on. Okay, so the rod isn't long enough to make it. These are, I mean, obviously with this off, and then it's got just enough to slide on. So, you know, there's another 50 bucks to go spend. And these guys, I mean, you could use them on the top. Whatever, they're spares. If you're using, obviously, a set of primes or a more compact lens, then these are fine. They, you can use them. But one more thing to be aware of. All right, so let's talk about the front of the lens since we're here. Um, there is a really nice lens shade on here. 
but you figure, well, you know, look, this is the bare element. I probably ought to put something on there, at least for any sort of doc or news style shooting where it's just an unpredictable environment. Stuff happens. Let's just protect the lens. It's not expensive, right? Oh. Okay. First question is, well, let's just take this thing off and let's see what size the filter is, right? So off that comes and there's no filter thread here. Now I did know that they want you at least like this to put on a clamp-on filter. And if you want to set this up with a clamp-on matte box, you can do that, but not necessarily a best recommendation considering the weight of all this. So here's the lens shade. It's pretty big. And I thought first maybe somehow this came apart and that you could put a um, 138 millimeter round in here, which would be cool because you could use a, a clear filter like Eighth Pro Mist or a polarizer or something. It'd be great to be able to stick a 138 millimeter round in here, but you can't because they didn't design it that way. There is documentation about the diameter of this. It's buried in the Fuji docks, which are split up into two parts. So the manual, which is PDF or printed, doesn't matter, is printed in like three, four pages and a bunch of different languages, how, how the lens works, what the controls sort of do, documentation for the dip switches, which is really important. They kind of assume that you know, you know, what this is, what size this is, because guess what? They're all different. But this front of the lens shade is threaded and the size is 127 millimeters. Um, I think the Canon, don't quote me on this, is 110 or 105. I'm not sure, but this is a clear 127 millimeter filter. Fuji has one. It's 800 bucks. No, I didn't buy it. Uh, Tiffin and I think Schneider both make a filter like this for a little over 400 bucks new. And I got this one on eBay in absolutely pristine, like new condition for 200 score. So with that, we can screw this in. And it's not a bad idea if you take a little pencil graphite and lubricate the threads to make sure that this hopefully doesn't seize up. I've never over torqued this, but I did lubricate the threads with a little graphite. Um, or to the wise. And then there's a dot on top to line it up back on the lens. Slip this thing on. There we go. Lined up. Lock it. And now our lens is protected. I recommend using a clear filter. Don't use a UV filter. I mean, if you have to use it in an emergency, whatever, but UV filters typically can tend to be a little bit yellow and change your colors around. So don't use them. Just try and get a clear uh, straight glass protection. Don't get a cheap filter. You might get away with it in the middle range of the lens, but when you zoom out to the long end of the lens, a 120 millimeter cheap filter is going to show itself every time in loss of resolution. And this is a beautifully sharp lens. So why would you mess up this beautifully sharp lens on a great camera with a cheap filter? Don't do it. The camera cage. So this is the basic shape package. It took five weeks to get shipped from Canada, made basically to order, I think. I think they're very running very tight. If you don't find it in stock, just be prepared that you might be waiting to get this particular cage. You might wind up using a different brand or some other different config. But if you really like this, then uh, just be prepared to wait. And that's the main thing that I need to say about this. I did get the extender grip here, which if you don't have a lens with a big grip on it, you can take this, click it, rotate it around, and you get the extender and you can put it down in here and it's great, it's perfect. I tend to leave it on the camera, one for quick lens changeovers, but two, because I can actually use the dial on here to adjust the iris. I don't have to use that annoying button on the body. This is a great little viewfinder. It's only three and a half inches, but it's good enough for you to see. It's good enough for putting it on the back and letting producer to client be able to see it. That all works great, but this isn't exactly the way Canon thought you should put this together. They have this almost conventional like camera 
I don't want to, I have no idea what to call this, but it looks like the front of a conventional ENG camera. It's a whole bracket piece that screws into the front handle. It's got a mic holder and it intends that the viewfinder here screws into here and that you sit it here or you can fold it around sort of like this, but then it's in the way of the handle. Um, so I took it apart. It's all quarter 20 hardware and screwed it into the back here. And I think it works pretty good here because you can do that. And you can actually, I wouldn't, shouldn't break it. There we go. You can spin it around and use it for selfie cam. You can keep it on the side for your general operator use, or you can swing it around and back. You can even, if I didn't have my uh, bracket here, put it on an AC side. So it's a pretty good spot to mount this on. Canon intended for this thing to be mounted up here and that you were gonna use some kind of viewfinder loop, but they don't supply it, unlike Sony, which does. It's a very strange thing. Zacuto makes one, it's a great product. You can certainly go that route if you need to skimp a few pennies. I went a different route and I got the Chameleon viewfinder from Zacuto, which is an absolutely great, amazing piece. Um, probably one of the nicest viewfinders I've ever seen. Half the price of Canon's. Canon's is four grand, ouch. Basically, it's a great viewfinder. It works right. Um, the thing I don't get are, are the cables. Why they're on the bottom and why they stick out like this. I'm kind of speechless about that. But let's follow these cables around, will we? So they start here. I got a little Velcro loop here. Routed them around the camera and they come around and come out here. And, you know, this cable looks pretty good. Maybe the yellow is a little weird, but I made this cable. Why did I do that? Well, your choices are this little one foot cable, which isn't going to get you very far, or you got one guess. Yeah, a one meter cable. So that means you got another glob of wire to try and hide or wrap around on the camera somewhere. I thought that was crazy. So what I wound up doing was I got the one meter cable. I cut it apart. It had this loom stuff on it. Just cut it all apart and got a 24 inch BNC wire, 90 on that end, 90 on this end, put it together. I took the power wire and I cut it down, resoldered it up in here. Why is this guy important? This guy is important because of this power switch here. You can't find this connector anywhere. And I know I've looked uh, you can probably buy them in large quantities, like 1,000 or 10,000 pieces, but you can't get them onesies, twosies. That's... And the switch, which I found, is a stock switch, does fit into the existing hole of a DTAP connector. So theoretically, you could buy these switches and you can get them in small quantities, put it in a DTAP connector and build your own. But I had this here, I was like, done. I don't care. So that's all set up. This guy, I really, I'd kind of wish I'd gone with a straight back end because right underneath it here is the main SDI output for the camera. This is your signal out that you're going to hook up to record to or feed a live view or whatever you're going to feed. So if this had been straight, this would be easier to get onto. My blunder, and maybe I'll remake this cable at some point. Uh, I mean, obviously this is cheap and the time to take this apart is not a big deal. Let's talk about this guy, the XLR connector. Four pin, yay, this is a standard power connector. You should figure we should all be happy about that. Except, it doesn't power up all the functions in the expansion back. So everything forward of this connector, the whole camera works, all these guys work. The lens port will not work, and apparently a couple other pieces on here will not work. The gen lock in does. So since we've kind of been working our way around the camera, let's talk about the battery. I turned the camera off. This is a V-mount, and this is an IDX plate that is on the back of the camera. And it's a perfectly great plate. It's got D-tap on the side, which I'm running into the splitter, and it's used to power everything else on here. So if I got a wireless mic receiver or video transmitter or whatever, I can plug those guys in there and we're off and running. So what if you really like gold mount? That's your battery system. And it has been for me forever. 
Well, no one could give me a straight answer about this. I said, well, can I just change this to a gold mount? Doesn't Canon have a service part? No. Doesn't Canon have like a factory service repair modification to change this to a gold mount? No. Why not? Don't people use gold mounts? Wow. Um, so I was kind of blown away by that. Once I got everything here, I actually took this apart. And this is what I found out. The whole pattern um, between gold mount and V mount is standardized. The, you can mount either plate on here, the screw holes line up, swap the screws over, done. The power connection. So this plate has a short wire with a two pin connector on it that plugs into the body that powers everything up. Great. But it's not on the gold mount, so you're going to have to cut that and solder it up. Obviously, you got to make sure that you keep your plus and minus correct. I mean, to me, that's not a big deal. For some people, it might be pretty scary because if you goof it up, ooh, you could let the blue genie out. And that could be bad news. So the reason I didn't put the gold mount on here is because I was concerned that I wouldn't get the date, the battery runtime out of the battery. Well, guess what? It doesn't work anyway with the V-mount, at least not these. Um, I have two different styles, neither of them worked. And well, wait a second, why did you even get into V-mounts? Why didn't you just an adapter plate? You can get a V-mount to gold mount plate. They're $50, $75, clip on here. They're pretty thin and really wouldn't made much difference. But I needed a couple new batteries. My gold mounts are all getting pretty tired. Uh, these batteries are pretty nice. They're new and they were in stock. If I wanted to get gold mounts, either I could buy some cheap imports or I could pay an absolute premium for that one brand name. And there really wasn't much choice in between. So these were in stock and I said, yeah, okay, fine. Get me a couple of these. They were actually on sale for 50 bucks off, which made the deal that much more attractive. I changed the plates on my charger actually from gold mount to V mount. I had a couple sitting around. So I have V mounts on here and that's how I wound up doing this. Um, it works. It's fine. It's easy on, easy off. This V mount tends to latch on pretty well, unlike some other ones that I've used where they don't always latch and the battery can fall off. Uh, you know, it's just one of those is what it is things. The thing that I miss from the gold mount is that the gold mount would have a pair of holes on the back here and then you could put one of those plates here and you could mount your uh, wireless accessories or whatever back there. This has no provision for that. There's no mounting or screw holes of any sort. So I wound up with this. This is a pair of small rig G3, G4 mounting plates and a piece of aluminum that I drilled, tapped holes in for, and it's up here on a ram mount. And it's actually really nice. It's a very small, compact, tight to the body mount, and it doesn't interfere with the handle. And that worked out great. I also have my Noga arm up here. I got a long one up here. And I have a Condor blue mount on it, quick release mount, that are pretty much standardized. So I can either mount them, you know, a Shinobi monitor up here, or I can hang this out front wherever, and I can put a camera light on. So this worked out really well. Oh, back to the viewfinder, since we were talking about this and I kind of ran around the camera. The mount. This is the more expensive Zacuto mount, the Axis Mini or whatever they call it. It's got a pair of fluid clutches on here that are kind of sensitive, but they work. You can position this wherever you want, nice and easy, and that all works great. If it's slipping like it is, you just tighten it a smidge, and there you go. These are temperature sensitive, so if you're in the cold, you're going to have to loosen them up a little. If it's hot out, you might have to close them down, but it's a fraction, fraction of a turn. This also has a front to back adjustment, so you can be more forward or you could put it back for rear operation. Whatever works, whatever you're comfortable with, you can get this in the right spot. The magic to make this work is that this has a 15 mil rod and there is this bracket in here, which came from Berkey System. 35 bucks. This thing is absolutely a rock. It's screwed into the quarter 20 hole in the handle, the stock handle, and I've got it tarked in pretty good. This has been on here for a couple of months and it's stayed put and it's great. And if I ever really needed to move it, I've got the knob here that I can adjust it. But 
I don't because this still pivots here. Um, so there's no advantage necessarily of rotating this, but you can move it in and out. Coming back around to the extender back, you see I've got this nice right angle short XLR cable. So if I've got this up on my shoulder, I don't have a straight connector here that's going to poke me in the head and eventually break the connector off. These are special order. They said they were in stock. One shipped immediately. The second one, which I haven't made the cable up yet, should up in a month. This is connected all the way over to a Sankin, uh, what is this, a CM1, and it's perfect in here. It doesn't stick out too far. You're not going to snag it on doors or furniture or your people or whatever. It's nice and short. It's a super high quality mic. It's expensive. You get what you pay for. You could certainly find other short shotguns or even a hypercardoid in here would work great. And you can phantom power it and it works fine in here. This mic mount is actually a replaceable part. But again, with a long shotgun, why do I have to worry about replacing this when I could just put a nice high quality short mic in here and be done with it? I hope I've given you a lot of really good insight into this. It was a very complicated process to get this camera built and running. Start to finish, it was probably two and a half months to go from placing the order, the camera body and the back showed up, and then the rest of the pieces came in different orders depending on supply chain issues and shipping and COVID and FedEx taking five days to deliver a box. That was pretty bad, um, but it's working great. Uh, the other question that you might ask now that we got the whole thing built is this body with the PL mount and the grip handle is four and a half pounds and it's a pretty nice compact little setup. And I think maybe the first two weeks I had this camera, that's the only time it's ever been built like this. What does it weigh? Well, this is a couple pounds. This is a pound. This lens is the same weight as the Canon but because it's not all the big heavy element glass elements in the front, they're more dispersed. This is a much more balanced design. 27 pounds. It actually probably weighs as much as one of those old beta cams with a five pound brick battery on it. It might be slightly heavier. It's frustrating because I figured with the body weight of four and a half pounds that I'd have a really pretty light shoulder rig that might hit 15, but such was not the case. And I've been contemplating whether there are a few ways of lightening it up or not. And I don't know. I mean, everything pound, two pound, three pounds, it adds up. Gravity does this thing and, uh, it's kind of heavy, but it's also pretty, pretty stable. This sits well on the shoulder. This comes right off. Uh, these guys I love because you can get them in tight. You can pop this thing off. This down by the body is great. In fact, you can even just push the handle in and stick it into your gut a little bit. But it gives you a sense of you don't have to tight, keep this hand super tight. It can kind of hang out loose. And then when you want to take a little bit more control, this is nice and tucked in. It's not out here. I mean, I see these rigs where guys are running around supporting all this weight out there and it's so uncomfortable. It's so tiring here. It's like, okay, this is still reasonably balanced. Um, so this works okay. Once in a blue moon, I'm going to reach up here and mess with this, but for the most part, hand is in here on the grip and, uh, this is a pretty nice setup. That was the lens foot. It just dropped out. Always check this. Always, always check this. These things don't always catch. These Sony plates are just evil. Fuji supplies you with a pair of these little short adapters that screw up into the center of the lens here. And then you can use them to put a lens support here. I started out that way. Again, it was weight. This thing feels absolutely rock solid. The Canon PL mount is just a giant hunk of machine stainless steel. It's super tight. It's super strong. Uh, it makes the standard EF mount just look like flimsy cast metal garbage because it is. I didn't say that, did I? I haven't felt, at least in this config, that this is critical to have this. So there you go.
again, I hope I saved you guys, I don't know how many weeks of time and research to get this information into one place because it is not out there. And we'll see you next time. In fact, I'm going to try and shoot some images with this and see what this lens looks like.